So I tend to agree with uh, Justice Dhingra on the point that the observations have an impact on the reputation of a person and also have the impact of creating a chilling effect as far as free speech is concerned, especially in matters of religion. But as he said, it does not amount to prejudicing the case on merits. I hope nobody actually uses this or cites this. Uh, see, ultimately you have to realize one thing. As far as uh, even the law is concerned, even assuming for a moment that something had been said and had been captured in the order, the law is very clear that if a comment is captured in writing, even in the order, which has got nothing to do with the issue before a particular bench, even that observation does not have the force of law. Now, given the fact that the original petition before this bench was for clubbing of FIRs, any comment with respect to the merits, assuming that it had been captured in the order, even that would have to be ignored because that was not the issue before the court. Considering that in this case, even that was not captured in the order and was merely made for, let's say, uh, made during the course of the hearing without being captured in the order, it cannot and hopefully should not have any bearing at all. But the one thing that we have to bear in mind is that during uh, the analysis of exercise of free speech, the one factor that is typically considered in jurisdictions across the world is whether the person who is exercising his free speech is conscious of his position and his ability to shape opinions and influence opinions. So, for instance, if I were to make a statement as a private citizen, that has a certain impact. But if a person holding a public office such as the prime minister or a constitutional organ such as the Supreme Court makes a statement, then it has a specific bearing. It has a certain consequence. Hmm. Therefore, you're expected to understand the reach and strength of your punch when you land that punch the moment you occupy a position of responsibility. Notwithstanding the fact it may not have a, let's say, a direct or a theoretical bearing, it still has a bearing as far as the court of public opinion is concerned. Hmm. So to that extent, I would say that while it may not affect the final analysis on merits, it certainly has the effect of telling people these are subjects that are not to be touched henceforth or there would be serious consequences to the extent that you may be denied basic reliefs which ought to have been granted in the first place. Therefore, my simple su su submission here is the order of 10th of August 2022 is the simple order the court perhaps ought to have passed on the 26th of May itself without having landed into these kind of issues. Now, the good part about, let's say, both the orders, at least to some extent, is the first order does not mention anything on merits. And the order of 10th of August clearly says that the bench does not express any opinion on the merits or the allegations contained in these FIRs. So for all practical purposes, the order of 26th of May has merged into the order of 10th of August. Therefore, to that extent, this secures Nupur Sharma's position as far as her defense on merits is concerned, as and when that situation arises, either in a 226 or a 482, that's for her to take call. Deepak. Jay Sai Deepak, I want to ask you, Justice Dhingra is going to be harangued and I will perhaps be targeted and so will the channel. So I want to ask you, is there a case here for contempt? Let's ask that because, you know, let's nip it in the bud if it is. So let me first uh, uh, give people a clear picture of who Justice Dhingra is. He is one of the few members, gutsy members of the judiciary when he was uh, still on the bench. He went ahead and passed judgments against rank criminals to grave peril to his life. And he was actually given security, additional security to protect himself. And he did not change his verdict. OK, so I don't think people need to worry about Justice Dhingra because I think he can defend himself and he knows exactly what he is doing. But should it come to, let's say that here I state on public record. I am happy to represent Justice Dhingra free of charge in any forum should he be harangued for contempt of court. Wonderful. And I say this without a degree of being facetious. I am as serious as I can get as a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> so the point I'm trying to make is there is no, according to me, there is no case made out here because look, the people are entitled to draw their own inferences, especially with respect to two set of instances. In fact, I don't even think Zubair's case is comparable to Nupur Sharma's because I think Zubair's case is worse than Nupur Sharma's. Hmm. Okay. In such a situation, if he gets multiple hearings and assume for a moment that the court sticks to the mandate before it as far as what was the petition filed before the court 
so by his where is concerned the simple question that people are entitled to ask is what is missing here and what is it that nupur has done which did not merit the same kind of clinical treatment within the bounds of the law that's a question that people are entitled to ask and answer if the contempt of court act is going to be wielded in this fashion as the sword of democles to even stifle people from raising questions with respect to the manner in which let's say certain orders are passed in comparable matters and let's say in worser matters so to speak then what remains of the republic's right to hold the judiciary to account you can't appoint you don't have a say in appointing you can't ask about assets you can't criticize then what are we supposed to do surrender like the people before reformation uh, before the catholic church well that led to the reformation <laughs> so all i would like to say is that it's important for everybody to realize that the higher you go in the in let's say in the ladder of power the responsibility on your part to actually take criticism comes along with it no other judiciary in a comparable jurisdiction in what we 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 call fashionably called civilized jurisdiction yes expect judges or let's say members of the judiciary to be shielded from any kind of criticism let me say this the questions raised by justice dhingra are with respect to the manner in which a particular matter has been discharged or a manner uh, the manner in which a particular matter has been disposed or handled this has got nothing to do with any kind of personal conduct okay so contempt would be in a situation where you are looking at the personal conduct as opposed to looking at the manner in which a particular let's say duty has been discharged while sitting on the bench if that particular conduct is not amenable to any kind of scrutiny by the republic then i might as well say that we are in for the tyranny of the unelected blown away by the uh, remarkable views of justice dhingra i really i mean his uh, stature has grown in my eyes by what he said it is a pity that uh, only a retired judge has made such stinging remarks against what happened and what the supreme court did unfortunately we live in a society where the practicing judges are still in service none of those have remarked upon what the supreme court did there are two issues here rahul and because this is converse everyone's having a wonderful discussion it allows me to uh, you know let the the dust of my thoughts settle so uh, as i see it there are two important issues number one is of course the comment on what jay sai also elaborated on and justice dhingra did and you have been that the supreme court has acted a couple of days ago how it should have a month ago now i have always believed as a, a man of science that law should also be as replicable and reproducible and to fall back upon as science is there is no point if in science one day you think of something and the other day you dispute that and say look this is not what we have come up with law should be banked upon it is bankable but what we saw a couple of days ago was yes delivery of justice but what we saw a month and a half ago was throttling of it at the hands of midwives meant to deliver it and that is why i say that the absurdity of any law by which i mean the 295a under which nupur has been charged the absurdity soon brings out the absurdity in those tasked with implementing it and that is what exactly happened and what justice dhingra has actually now commented upon now let me quote here verbatim a few oral remarks made by those two judges and you will see what i exactly what i mean the two judges were justice surekant and jp pardiwala when they a month and a half ago refused to entertain the exact same plea that they have done now given relief to nupur uh, which was to club multiple fir's against her court you have ignited the whole country you are single handedly responsible for the burnings in the country your statement is responsible for the unfortunately killing in udaipur you should apologize to the whole country for your remarks power has gone to your head you made irresponsible statements without an inkling of the ramifications and serious consequences uh, that how serious it will disturb the fabric of the society end court and in the intervening month and month and a half after those remarks more than half a dozen people have been brutally attacked just for supporting nupu pratik neeraj satendra ayush mahendra umesh who will take responsibility for this rahul the two judges who will apologize who will be held accountable it is all right for people to say that the oral remarks do not go into the final remarks but if those two remarks are uh, by those two judges are held seriously they should at least apologize be held accountable they are giving no was akin to blaming the kashmiri hindus for their own murder rape and pretending that they were prosperous or held good jobs in kashmir it was akin to the british blaming rajdi for the fuckon or the french blaming charlie and the journalist and samuel pati for their satisfied precedent and settled law 
Goswami and others support one. They mocked her plea. They ignored what had happened. Yes. The barbarians were waiting for her at the gate. And a few days ago, they wiped the fake plea as though nothing had happened. Rahul, yes, justice was delivered finally. But it was delayed. And point number two, very briefly. You see, this is also the crux of the matter which judges and lawyers like uh, Desai and Deegra to elaborate on, to discuss this. The judges claimed Nupur Sharma displays rude terms. I'm sorry. It wasn't Nupur Sharma, but rather the two Supreme Court judges who displayed it. And that is the thing with all the remarks. They carry weight. They are taken seriously by the lower courts, by the political parties, by the citizens, and also by the media. The media and the Congress, remember Rahul, amplified from rooftop for 10 years when the court called Narendra Modi a modern-day Nero in 2002. Did it not? It was an oral remark. Later on, the same Supreme Court acquitted Modi of all charges, but still the opposition called the modern-day Nero. Another example, Madras High Court recently called the Election Commission a murderer should be tried for murder charges. Yes. The EP went to the Supreme Court to get the remarks expunged, but the Supreme Court refused to expunge them. And by the way, who can forget the case parrot remarks that the SC made on the CBI that we still court free? But in the Nupal case, the ramifications are very serious. I mean, CBI, everyone calls uh, a case parrot. But the problem with Nupal and the oral remarks made by the judges were, it gave validity. It buttressed the Sir Sanse Juda gang and the, the proof was in the pudding in the intervening month and a half when six people had been attacked. All those people who attacked those six people would have said, look, the Supreme Court agrees with us. And that is the problem with the oral remarks. They have to be expunged, I'm afraid. And the Supreme Court should uh, render an apology if we are to move ahead.